Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Without a Trace by Ariana Nash Narrated by Cornell Collins 1. Alexander Everything had to be perfect. Dinner out. Our first official excursion from the cottage. In the six months since our apparent deaths, John and I had traversed Scottish locks and mapped every gorse bush and patch of heather in a five-mile radius of the cottage. I'd read the limited collection of books three times, and John had fixed the cottage's old plumbing while teaching himself how to summon and control the source. It was time for phase two, living our new lives in public. Me as Harvey Lloyd, and John as Christopher Jennings. Harvey and Chris. The names were taking some getting used to. Nobody knew us, besides the intrepid postman and grocery delivery driver. Alone we were still very much Alex and John. But that had to change if our new identities were going to stick. Dinner out was the beginning of phase two. John rode in the passenger seat of the Range Rover I'd recently bought using Harvey Lloyd's healthy bank balance. His gaze tracked over the rolling Scottish highlands. He'd grown his hair out, allowing its loose waves to lick the bottom of his jaw. It suited him, and gave me something satisfying to grip when I bent him under me. I'd grown a hint of a beard, not too long. The itch was unbearable. Just enough to scrub the notion from anyone we met that I might be the clean-cut Alexander Kempthorne who had died in an unfortunate accident. You all right? he asked. Yes. He'd seen me glancing over. I was wondering whether to shave off the beard. His smirk was enough to cut me off, and then his gaze turned sly, and the delicious kind of hungry. That would be a bloody shame. If he liked it, then so did I. I chuckled, now a victim of his scrutiny, and pulled the Range Rover into the restaurant's parking lot, on the outskirts of Fort William. During mid-tourist season, the parking lot was almost full, and tonight was no exception. We'd have no trouble blending into the crowd. Two unknown faces from out of town wouldn't raise any eyebrows. John climbed from the Range Rover. I met him on his side of the car, spotting his thumbs tucked into his trouser pockets and the quizzical look on his face. What is this? he asked. I'd only told him we were going out for the evening, not where. Dinner. His smile ticked. Is that a good idea? We certainly can't stay isolated forever. You sure it's been long enough? We're about to find out. His smile was the good, relaxed kind. Lead on, Harve. Harvey, I corrected, walking up the little winding path to the restaurant's front door. Chatter and laughter bubbled from inside. Sounds neither of us had heard in months. John Dominici and Alexander Kempthorne were dead and buried. This was Chris and Harvey's first genuine test. Whatever you say, Harve. He was impossible, and I loved him for it. As I opened the door, a blast of noise hit us. I hesitated, then held the door open for John and met his smirk with my own. He knew how to tease, and he knew how it drove me wild. If he continued with those salacious glances all evening, we wouldn't make it back to the cottage before I made sure he paid for them. Against the Range Rover's front grill, my hand on his erection, just out of public sight. And risky enough to be exhilarating. What has you smirking? he whispered. Nothing suitable for public conversation. I'd booked us a table near the windows, with a view of the inky lock and twilight sky nestled between distant mountains. So, John said, once we'd settled in our seats. The server handed us both menus and poured the wine I'd pre-ordered. Finally, this is the dinner you promised me? Sorry, it's a few months late. He lifted his glass. To new beginnings. New beginnings. We chinked our glasses ordered, ate, drank wine, and chatted. And the restaurant could have been a McDonald's for all the attention I gave it. John was all I cared to admire. He talked about the time he'd gotten caught stealing pens from the school supplies and selling them to the kids on the playground. He'd been twelve, 
and had only been caught because a friend had grasped him up. I'd heard the story before. We'd shared a great deal from our pasts during the quiet times in the cottage. But let him tell it again, enjoying the timbre of his voice and the way his eyes sparkled with mischief. You going to tell me what happened at that theatre where you got tasered? I chuckled. The dessert arrived. Two chocolate and truffle cheesecake ensembles that had heart attack written all over them. John tucked in, fork prying the dessert apart, then sliding it between his lips. It's not nearly as exciting as I've made it out to be. Try me. He teased the dessert with his fork, picking up delicate pieces and eating them seductively, not needing to say a word. He knew I was his. All he had to do was crook a finger and I'd be on my knees. I cleared my throat and shifted in the chair, then told him about the disastrous theatre trip, my recall trailing off whenever he licked his fork. He laughed at the story, his demeanour so relaxed I never wanted this night to end. So what's all this really about? he asked, carefully dissecting the final piece of cheesecake. I blinked, ambushed. What do you mean? He shrugged and scooped a tiny morsel onto his fork. You're nervous. No, I'm not. He laughed, devoured the bite of cheesecake and pointed the fork at me. That, Mr. Lloyd, is a lie. I picked up my wine, took a gulp and slowed the second he grinned, knowing me too well. I'm excited to be here, that we're here, together. Like you said, new beginnings. His right eyebrow arched. He still smiled, so I wasn't yet in trouble, just skirting the edges. There had been a time he wouldn't have been able to read me. Nobody had broken through my barriers. I'd made sure of it. But I couldn't keep John Dominici out of my head, even if I'd wanted to. He'd witnessed too much, and the rest I'd shared. Hm. No. That was a lie. And touched on the one thing he needed to know. The one thing I'd tried and failed to tell him a hundred times in the cottage. The last secret between us. Like an unseen thorn in my side. But that wasn't what I'd brought him here for. He was right, I was nervous. And it had nothing to do with the dinner or venturing out in public. His smile cracked. Al, uh, Harvey. He'd seen something on my face. Some nervous little twitch had slipped through. Bloody hell. I laughed him off with a dismissive wave and refilled our glasses from the wine bottle. It's nothing. Which from you means it's definitely something. He set his fork down and peered through his lashes. Leaning back in the chair, I smiled into my glass. Drink your wine. You're going to end up with this wine all over that nice shirt if you don't spill whatever it is that has your heart racing. Harv, I don't need to hear it. I can feel your trick churning. That last part he said low and quiet, then leaned forward on the table and narrowed his eyes. It's not important. An absolute lie, and I averted my gaze, unable to withstand his scrutiny a second longer. It might have been the most important thing I'd ever had to say. But my heart was racing, nerves ratcheting up. Because it wasn't as simple as just saying the words. The fuck it isn't. The teasing tone had vanished, and when I looked, his smile was long gone. What's going on? It's something bad, isn't it? No. What aren't you telling me? Chris, I hissed, keep your voice down. Shaking his head, he sighed and then downed his glass of wine. I'm not doing this. He stood and threw down his napkin. You promised me no more lies. I had said that. I recalled having him wrapped in my arms, naked and slick breathing hard, and I'd told him those exact words. Perhaps the dinner hadn't been such a great idea, perhaps this was all too soon. Perhaps I was a fool for getting this far. And I meant it, if you'd calm down, this could be great. He threw his arms wide. You and me, we're fucking awesome. A few heads turned our way, I was going to have to stop him, and fast. But you can't help keeping those secrets. His eyes flashed, excess tricks simmering inside him. You have to stop. Will you marry me? Oh, good Lord. It was out there. I'd said it. I couldn't take it back, not that I'd want to, but now I'd said it. It was real and not an insane idea I hadn't been able to get out of my head for the past six months. My heart stopped. 
I was definitely having a heart attack brought on by the deadly dessert, or it might have been the beginnings of a panic attack because John stared, his mouth open, and it seemed as though the entire restaurant had fallen silent. My heart thudded in my ears, behind my ribs everywhere. I hadn't heard of any latent spiralling from asking one question, but there was always a first time for everything. Fuck, John said. Well, that is not the answer I was expecting. He raked a hand through his hair and stepped back from the table. Fuck. Again, not entirely a reply. I hadn't exactly done this before, and I'd planned for it to go slightly different, such as on my knee, with the ring I'd walked seven miles into Fort William for and then back again, to pick up without him knowing. The ring! I fumbled in my pocket, grateful I didn't have to see his wrecked expression and wonder why, if we were so great together as he'd just suggested, he looked as though I'd just punched him in the chest and torn out his heart, not offered him mine. I pulled the velvet box free. John saw it, recoiled, and couldn't have fled the restaurant any faster if he'd sprinted off a start line. Jilted, I slumped back in my chair. No, that definitely had not gone as I'd imagined. He'd fled our table like a crime scene. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Harvey, would you like the bill? The server had seen and heard all of it and had no idea where to look. I tucked the velvet box back into my pocket and cleared my throat. Yes, I think that's probably a good idea. 2. Dom Fuck. I... Fuck! I paced in front of the Range Rover, then braced against the hood. Fuck! Christ, my heart was going to explode or stop or thump through my ribs. I pushed off the car and paced some more. Happy noises continued to spill from inside the restaurant, people laughing, joking, having a great time. Alex was in there. He'd... He'd asked me... Me... To marry him... I pressed a hand over my chest and tried to remember how to breathe. He'd asked me, and what had I done? I'd lost it, that's what I'd done. I'd lost my shit and left him there. Fuck. Gravel crunched under my boots. Oh, Christ. He'd asked, so I had to answer, right? That was how these things worked. Only I couldn't. How? How was I supposed to answer that? He could have warned me, but no, he'd gone and dropped the bombshell with no notice, no warning. Six months we'd been in that cottage, six months, and he hadn't even hinted that he... Oh, I'd known he was nervous. He'd been nervous all day, maybe all week. Kind of shady, sometimes quiet, damn jumpy. I'd known something had been up with him, but not that. The car pulled into a spot in the lot, and a smiley couple climbed out, glancing over. I braced against the Range Rover's hood again, threw them a fake smile and a nod, so they didn't see me teeter on the verge of having some kind of latent breakdown. And the second they looked the other way, I groaned and bowed my head between my arms to stare at the ground. Oh, God. We'd been doing just fine. Why had he asked? I lifted my head and blinked. A brown A4-sized envelope had been tucked under the right windshield wiper. No name. None of the other parked cars had one. Desperate for the distraction so I could think and breathe again and pretend I hadn't just run away from my boyfriend's fucking marriage proposal, I grabbed the envelope, tore it open and pulled out several sheets of what appeared to be bank statements. The Kempthorne Enterprises logo had been stamped in the top right-hand corner. Alex's family business, I figured. It took me too long to realise the fact it was there tucked in an envelope on our Range Rover windshield meant someone knew who we were and where we were. And that was very, very bad. A world scanning the shadowy bushes for any suspicious movement. The noises from the restaurant no longer seemed so jovial and the night no longer harmless. Nobody was obviously lurking nearby, but someone had been here and left the envelope. I examined the sheets of paper again. Bank accounts, for sure. Several six-figure sums of money had been ringed. Amounts leaving the Kempthorne accounts for something called Blackwater. What the fuck was Blackwater? Alex needed to know. But that meant going back inside the restaurant. 
and as right as that idea was, I also really did not want to walk back in there and see the awful look on his face when he thought something ridiculous, like I didn't want him. It wasn't that. It could never be that. I just... The restaurant door opened and Alexander Kempthorne jogged down the steps, jacket flaring, face cold. When he marched to the car, he made sure to avoid me. He unlocked the car with a blip of the alarm and climbed behind the wheel. Oh man, I'd messed up. I'd messed us up. I'd messed the dinner up, fucked all his plans, ruined everything, and he was pissed. And now I had to show him that someone was onto us? Maybe it would be better to wait a few hours until he'd cooled off, so he didn't accidentally trigger some kind of spiralling episode. I folded the envelope, tucked it into my back pocket, opened the Range Rover door and got in. He put the car into gear and pulled out of the parking lot. Nobody followed us, I made sure to watch the mirrors. We were so far out in the sticks that there was no way someone could tail us for miles without being spotted. When we got home, the cottage fire had burned down to embers. Alex threw on a few logs and stoked it back to life, while I loitered in the kitchen area, stuck between wanting to go to him and having to explain why I'd bolted, but also knowing that whatever I had tucked against my back was going to upset everything I hadn't already, and I didn't want that. We'd been fine, him and me, it had been perfect. We should never have gone to fucking dinner. I'm going to bed. He started up the small iron spiral staircase. Alex. He stopped halfway, frozen, and still didn't look over. I had to say something. What if I just said yes? Would that fix everything? But what if I didn't want that? I did. At least I thought I did. I loved him, more than anything. I just... I wasn't for marrying. That shit didn't happen to me. Good night. He climbed the rest of the way in silence. Fuck, I whispered, and slumped against the kitchen counter. Why was I made like this? Why did I have to go and fuck everything good up? I needed Gina. She'd have told it to me straight. Made everything sound easy. But she wasn't here, and she could never be here. That life was over. John Dominici, Cecil Court. Gone. This was a fresh start. I could be anyone. I was Chris now. And Chris did not have to be a knob. After rummaging through the cupboards, I found the stash of whiskey, poured a glass and sat at the little kitchen table. Then spread the bank statements out to get a better picture of what I was seeing. Over two million pounds had been sent to Blackwater in a two-week period. Whoever had left the envelope expected Blackwater to mean something. I grabbed my phone, googled it, and, sipping the whiskey, scrolled through the results. Name of an indie rock band. They didn't sound much like a Kempthorne investment. Some romantic vampire novel. Again, not really a Kempthorne Enterprises interest. Blackwater. A privately owned military force. Hello. I sat up, clicked and brought up a fancy web page for Blackwater Military Research. Apparently, among other things, Blackwater had funded the creation of Venom, or Ink as the Americans knew it, the drug that turned latent soldiers into well-behaved murder machines. Kempthorne Enterprises had donated millions to Blackwater. Christ. Did Alex know? It probably didn't mean anything. The bank statements showed countless outgoing payments to other companies. Blackwater was just another way to move money. This kind of financial juggling was automated anyway, wasn't it? Handled by fund managers or some shit. The dates were from the previous year. I'd been working at Kempthorne & Co. Artifact Retrieval Agency during that time. Not that it mattered. Alex was in his company. He ran Kempthorne & Co. to protect Leighton's. Didn't he? I'd known he had connections to the military. He bought me, for fuck's sake. He'd admitted as much months ago. We'd gotten past all that. He bought me to keep me safe. To keep me out of the hands of people who would use my apparently special latent power for all the wrong reasons. But, according to Cage, back when we'd been on talking terms, Alex had also known or suspected I was a lot more of a unique latent than everyone had told me. Our trip to America had revealed how I could make more latents. And recently we'd figured out I could summon the source. 
although I had no idea what I was supposed to do with it other than being bathed in trick and kind of able to feel connected to all the latents through it. Maybe we were still figuring it out. Blackwater was private military research. Blackwater bankrolled Inc. Kempthorne Enterprises bankrolled Blackwater. If there was more to it, I wasn't going to get it from the statements. I'd ask Alex in the morning, when he wasn't pissed off. I grabbed a pat and throw, sprawled on the sofa by the fireplace, and finished off the bottle of whiskey as the fire died down. 3. Dom The smell of coffee and sound of sizzling bacon woke me. Alex was pottering about the kitchen. I stretched, winced at a jab from a looming headache, and glared at the empty bottle of whiskey by the sofa. With Alex's back turned, I hurried upstairs, showered and shaved, getting in front of the impending hangover, then breezed back into the kitchen to find breakfast waiting on the little table. I spotted Alex outside through the window, sipping coffee on the deck overlooking miles of crisp morning forest and in the distance, the peak of Ben Nevis. With his watch glinting on his wrist, the whole scene could have been straight out of a posh TV ad for expensive shit. He looked the part having that perfectly rugged chic down to an art. I should apologise for the previous clusterfuck that had been our dinner, but I also needed to bring up Blackwater. He'd moved the documents to the end of the counter so he'd seen them. Did he know what they meant? It was time for some questions. I grabbed a piece of toast, threw a strip of bacon inside, picked up my coffee and joined him on the deck. The air smelled of wet pine and moss. Hey, morning. Finally, his blue eyes met mine and he smiled his soft morning smile. I hadn't realised how much I'd needed to see that smile until that moment. Whatever happened, whatever all this meant, we were going to be okay. So, about last night, where did the documents come from? He asked. Okay, we were starting there. I leaned against the rickety timber rail. Someone left it on the Range Rover. I was going to tell you, he waved the explanation away. It's done. His hand dove into his trouser pocket and for a few seconds I thought he was going for the ring box again and that I might make everything a hundred times worse if he did. But he took out a small black plastic rectangular box instead and set it down on the rail between us. A tracker. The implications of it being here were dire. I found it under the wheel arch. He didn't sound alarmed, just mildly irritated. Bollocks! I should have known last night to check for anything, but hadn't exactly been thinking clearly. I scanned the nearby tree line. Our location had been compromised. Everything was compromised. We had to leave. The shotgun is behind the door, Alex added, but I haven't seen any signs of movement. How long have you been out here? Since dawn. While well, I'd slept on the sofa like an idiot. I should have told you as soon as I opened it. Hmm. We should pack up and leave. If we can get out before they... We aren't going anywhere. Whoever it is knows who we are. Our whole identities are fucked. They will come to us. He was handling this a lot better than me. He didn't even look ruffled. He just leaned against the rail, sipping his coffee. As though nothing had changed. I chewed on my bacon toasted sandwich, feeling foolish in more ways than one. I'd jumped to all the wrong conclusions last night, called him a liar, and all he'd been doing was trying to make everything perfect for the big question. What did that say about me? I should have trusted him more. And now this tracker and the bank statements, and I hadn't told him when I should have. If I'd told him, he'd have known to search for the tracker and our location would be safe. Now we were sitting ducks in the middle of nowhere. It's all right. His mouth quirked in that small, sideways smile again. I sighed, needing to hear that. What did you make of the bank statements? Blackwater is private military research, I recalled. Your company donated to it like it donates to half a dozen other businesses. Blackwater also bankrolled Inc. That's about as far as I got. Does it mean anything to you? Yes, I'm afraid it does. He squinted toward the woods. It means Cage Mitchell will not let this rest. Cage? What's he got to do with anything? Alex tapped the tracker. American issued. Private, not military. Shit! 
LOA? No, he's working alone. Cage, you sure, or it could just be the LOA? Alex gave me the arched eyebrow. Yeah, OK. When it came to Cage Mitchell, I had a blind spot a mile wide. Cage had fucked us over to try to save his brother, then I'd killed his brother to save Alex, so there was that. He'd also tried to hand us both over to his buddies at the LOA. He'd been known to be good depending on what day of the week it was. Just enough to keep us all guessing. But he drugged me, readily executed latents, and all things considered, he was a dick. He's alive then. I hadn't been sure after the helicopter incident at the weird bunker house. Oh, he's alive. Alex spoke as though he knew for certain this was all Cage's doing. But how could he know that? From one tracker and a few bank statements. OK, so let's say it's him. How'd he find us? I set my empty coffee cup down and joined Alex back at the deck's wobbly rail again. He is resourceful and determined. How come he doesn't believe we're dead like everyone else? Because he knows a lie, John. This has Cage Mitchell written all over it. I was trusting Alex Wright, so I trusted him in this. Even if he was holding something back, like always. I'm just going to say this once, but you're right. When it comes to Cage, my judgement is fucked, but so is yours. You hate him, you've always hated him. It could be you're seeing him in this because you want to. It's possible. He finished his coffee, set the cups, 